Yeah, hi, my name is David. Um, first of all, thanks to the um, to the DevFest team to make this event um, possible and giving me the opportunity to, uh, to talk. And I will talk about development and deployment of polyglot systems. Um, disclaimer in the beginning, it's not the one and only way you can do this, it's just one way, we've done it, and therefore it's not the one and only truth. Yeah, said that, um, I'm happy to introduce me to you. I'm David. I've studied software engineering and business management at the University of Technology in Graz. Um, beside my studies, I founded my first company, um, Demacom, which was a web service agency. After that, I worked as tech lead for Relos charging systems. I then started a side project um, called Shared Spaces. And beginning this year, I co-founded the company Horatio. Does anyone know Horatio? Yeah, it's exactly what I expected. <laughs> um, yeah, the Horatio system. Horatio is basically a Q&A platform where you can um, ask questions and can get feedback on either a pro or a, or a contra side. So I have like normal commenting, but split it up in positive and negative opinions. Yeah, and we also started to, building, to build a um, plugin which publishers and bloggers can use on their website to have our pro and contra discussions there. Yeah, the ratio system. Um, we have four different languages, um, PHP, Scala, um, JavaScript and TypeScript and a variety of different frameworks. So we use Redis, MySQL, Play Framework, Akka, AngularJS, and some more. So, but why? Why we have chosen um, to go polyglot? Um, for me, as tech lead, it was a um, re really easy decision because Horatio started out as a hobby project in your, in your university. So we started with an old PHP framework, old PHP code, and Therefore, I made the decision that now, since we now do, uh, have done it like a real business, we have, we have to do it in some more advanced language or a more major platform. So, but uh, other reasons for going polyglot, like um, the system is already live. So if you if you're rebuilding your stuff and the system is already live, you probably don't want to rebuild all your features from scratch while the system is live because that, then you can't then you can't build any new features for a system. So you may choose to use the new stack to build new features and integrate it with your existing old system. Also, the technologies and hopefully the skills of your team evolve. Therefore, um, you may switch to a new platform or language. And the current stack is already technical depth. So as I said, we started with an old PHP platform and framework, and therefore, instead of rebuilding all this old PHP code into a new PHP system, we decided um, we go with Scala because Scala is way more better for that, we want, for that what we wanted to achieve. And yeah, it's also a possibility to get rid of all the legacy code. And also, um, if, you try, if you're beginning to make a polyglot pl platform, you're forced to design for a soft uh, service-oriented architecture. And if you start to design like that, it's easier to integrate new services or ex external services. So, service-oriented architecture. In our system, it was backend only. So only our backend code uh, were able to communicate with all the services. Our front-end apps were not possible to communicate with this backend. I will go uh, into detail later on. And you have to choose wisely what functionality you want to build as a web service because not every functionality is meant to be a standalone web service. So you have to really have to evaluate if it makes sense to decouple the service or not and if it, it's worth it. And um, yeah, you have to design it that you can use it from any platform or any language. Yeah, and if you do this, you have to be aware of what possible pitfalls are. Um, use only one message format. Don't mix up message formats. Don't communicate one service with XML and another with JSON. Only one message format. <laughs> and make extensive use of different HTTP requests and status codes. HTTP is 
um, was developed to communicate between services and machines. Therefore, it has a, not, a lot of request codes and status codes you may uh, don't know, which actually do what you need. Yeah. And, of course, document your internal API, because if you have new members, they need to know what's going on. So documentation is really important. <coughs> but I wanna, at Ratio, we want to go one step further. And I will, for the cycle presentation, I will call it app-oriented architecture, which basically means that it is a thin layer on top of the service-oriented architecture, and you form a set of features to a standalone app. So instead of having one huge or two huge backends or platforms, you have like multiple apps in the backend, and these backend apps communicate with your web services. Um, this is like how it looks at the ratio. We have like four or five different apps. One, as you can see, is the old platform. It's the old PHP platform. It's a standalone app. And another one is the widget or the plugins or the plugin, which is also a standalone app. And we also made a standalone app for moderation, where um, organizations can um, moderate their comments and stuff like this, and also own analytics app and a login app. So every app is not connected and decoupled from each other. So we have um, dedicated apps, and therefore they are easier to maintain and test, because you have like a set of functionality, which is only one app, instead of having too many apps. And since you have every app is dedicated, you, they don't affect your existing code base. And so you have less interference with other code, and therefore it's more stable. Because many of the large systems are a mess, and they have too much interference with, um, with their code. And you can also separate your business logic. Um, the negative sides of having this is over-fragmentation. You may be, or may make too many apps um, even there is no need for an own app. <coughs> so, also, sometimes it um, appears that you repeat your functionality. So, you build the functionality twice because you haven't built a web service yet for this, for this functionality. And, um, yeah, it's hard to achieve a model or entity consistency through all of our apps. Because um, if you make a new app, it's probably the worst thing if you just copy and paste all your entities into the new um, in the new app because if one app changes or the model changes itself, it's hard to distribute it to the other models. <coughs> so just lead me to the next point, um, model consistency. We've done it um, with use of code generators. Um, with code generators, you're able to generate code or can generate the entities or generate your models. Uh, there we have to define a model description language. And by model description language, is like a language which defines the members and the referral or referential integrity of all your entities. And you should only use one model description language, not two, not three, only one in your whole system. <coughs> and yeah, then you can use or write your own code generators to distribute um, this model or entities to all your languages. And yeah, if you have a combined language like Scala, it's probably a good idea um, to put like this code generation into a compiler hook so that it compiles your models automatically um, if it if they changes. Um, how we achieved this is a ratio. Um, since we started out with our PHP platform, as I already mentioned, um, and um, PHP or M called Doctrine, we defined this one as our MDL. Therefore. We defined all our entities and our refer referential integrity at this um, ORM. Um, but for our luck, um, our Scala ORM called Slick was able to generate um, case classes from this SQL code which the Doctrine ORM produces. And then we wrote an own code generator um, which generated the TypeScript classes from the um, Scala classes. So any at any time we made a change as a doctrine ORM or the entity at the doctrine ORM, um, it produces new SQL code. The new SQL code triggers um, a new compilation of the Scala entities, and this um, triggered a new uh, triggered the generation of the types of classes. So we had like 
all our entities were the same of all apps. Yeah, that was um, for the development part. But another important part is like the continuous deployment part. <coughs> yeah, our deployment strategies for deploying our system was, of course, always have a working branch. You always have to have one branch, if it's called master or production, never mind, which should be working at any time. Um, you should always use a staging environment, which means uh, it's an environment between the production environment and the development environment where you have a setup which is as close as possible to the production environment. And you should aim for immutable infrastructure, which means instead of applying changes to a code base of a server or redeploying the server, um, deploy a new system. So Therefore, you have to automate the whole setup and deployment of every part and layer of infrastructure. Um, yeah. Also, automate everything what is possible. Do as less, or don't do things manually, or don't try to do things manually. Try to automate everything. Therefore, make use of cloud providers' features. There are good cloud providers like Amazon, DigitalOcean, or Heroku, who have a lot of features who can help you for having a continuous integration pipeline. And yeah, shell scripts are your friend. If there's no feature, write a known shell script. Uh, why this automation is so important is um, a graph I always like to show. Um, it's like normal people, if they have more work, they need more time to achieve that. Good developers, um, See, okay, it's too much work that automate this, so they have less work for the same time. Yeah, and of course, deployment tools, user deployment tools. They got deployment tools like Jenkins, of course, Git, Capistrano, or Chef, and there are also some service, uh, software as a service providers like Circle CI or CodeChip, who help you integrate, uh, help to have your um, continuous integration platform. But also be aware, most of these. Um, Deployment tools say you can integrate in a few minutes. That's probably a lie. Um, you normally need one or two days to integrate in, on, in your whole procedure of deployment. Yeah, and last but not least, database migrations. It's always a pain if you have a live system. So, of course, some application changes need um, changes for your DB schema. And they can be simple or risky or both. And for sure, they're always a pain. Yeah, simple changes can be like adding a table, adding index and column or whatever. And there are also some risky changes like renaming a column, changing a foreign key, and migrating data from one table to another column or another table. Yeah. So there was one way how we achieved this in our live system. Um, because we didn't want to like shut our service down just to do this database migration, so we wanted to do all the migration on the fly. Um, therefore, we created a new table for every new entity who changed. So we had, if we had a user um, object and the user object um, got a new table, we made like a new table or a new entity. And then, when we queried um, the user object, um, we Query it first from the new table, and if it didn't exist, we query it from the old table, and if it existed there, we transferred it to the new table, and then updated all um, referential integrities. Yeah, and then we deleted the entity in the in the old table. So we're like migrating this on the fly, and if you have large data sets, you always uh, you additionally can run this proce procedure as a background job. So therefore, you have like always a new table. You just um, migrate the data from one table to another. Yeah, must-haves for this um, is a tool which keeps track of all the evolutions. So every migration script is like an evolution, and you have to keep track of them. And it should be a simple integration into the existing project. It doesn't make really sense if you have a guild tool which doesn't fit to your project. So um, we had 
we had real luck because um, Play has a built-in tool for database evolutions, so we could use this. But there are also other database evolution tools like Carbon5 or even more. And of course, you have to have a change log because you want to know what's, what's happened. And you always need to have up and down evolution, which means you have an apply script where you apply the changes, and you also have an unapply script. So if the changes goes wrong, you want to unapply these changes. So you have, you have this like migration script, which makes these changes of the apply script, or which reverts these changes of the apply script. And you should do intense testing, and you should also test with the database that is very similar to the production database. Like for example, a back upfront reduction database from yesterday or something like that. And hopefully, needless to say, um, make backups. Yeah, thank you. That's it. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer it. Thank you. Please. Um, how do I remain code usability? Um, this is what I, what I meant. Um, so you have to choose when you, do you build a web service and when not. So that's if you have like this many apps, it may occur that you have repeated functionality. So you have like functionality in this app and this app. And there you have to evaluate if it makes sense to make out a service of that or not. Yeah, I'm sharing JavaScript libraries. Please. My question, but I will tell you more. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, what you mentioned about uh, generating the um, uh, generating the, the do you use something similar or do you use some script or some generation for the, the web services layer? Like, I don't know, some similar tools that Um, so if I use different scammers for web services? No, okay. No, I don't repeat the services, I only repeat the apps. Um, if I document the service APIs, yeah, the service APIs are documented. No, normal recommendation for people. No schema, real schema less. Any other questions? If I roll, uh, if I build a migration system on my own, yeah, I built a migration system on my own. I didn't use um, any migration tools. I totally built it on my own. Yeah, the scripts and compiler hooks. Which build system? Um, SPD. Um, for my system setup, um, yeah, I'm not using Chef. I just put it on the slides because, because you can use it for it. I um, just write, uh, wrote my own shell scripts for setting it up. Okay, I think then we can have a coffee break. <laughs> Thank you.